Welcome to Everyday Supernatural with Matt Young. Have you ever wondered if there is more to life than the things you can see in the natural world? Have you encountered angels? Had a vision? Do you hear voices? Have you been healed miraculously or experienced the power of God? There are many examples in the Bible of spiritual events that are beyond our physical ability. And these exciting stories still happen today to people all around the world. I invite you to listen in and take part in the conversation while we learn to live your life like every day is supernatural. Hey guys, welcome to Everyday Supernatural. My name is Matt Young. Today, I'm going to talk about seven countries in about three weeks. Um, if you didn't know, uh, I had an opportunity to minister this summer in Austria. And um, along the way, we decided to have a family vacation for the first part of the trip. And then um, at the end of the trip, I decided to take my son to Malawi, Africa. Uh, he's 10 years old. And my daughter got to go to Malawi uh, to minister with me, uh, just her and I, when she was 10 as well. And so I thought, what a great time uh, for him to come experience uh, Malawi for himself, and uh, as well as uh, all these other countries. So we landed in Germany, the whole family. Uh, we got to experience Germany, stay the night there. Uh, then we got to uh, stay in uh, Aachensee, if I'm saying it correctly, in Austria, which was beyond unbelievable uh, vacation time, beautiful place, uh, beautiful city. Got to meet some uh, old friends and some new friends. Got to minister in Austria, which was a great time ministering with the uh, charismatic uh, Catholics there in a place called Loretto. Uh, great crowds, great people. And uh, my son uh, got to have some fun. I got drunk in the Holy Spirit one of the nights. And uh, he, you know, of course, he's seen it before, but he thought it was pretty funny. He was my little uh, photographer for a few photos. So he's like sticking the camera up, trying to, to get people uh, in the picture from the back of the room. And I just had a great time, stayed with some friends and my family, uh, my wife and daughter went home and then the rest of us headed to Malawi, Africa. So I thought I would share uh, kind of the behind the scenes of what happened there, read to you a few, few things that I wrote down from a journal entry. Uh, and this, so this mission trip, there was supposed to be 10 Americans and four people from Pakistan and uh, my Malawian friend Gideon. We were scheduled to do ministry, a safari, and then a couple of days at Lake Malawi. And so when you lead a mission trip, it's important uh, that you're flexible because things do not always go as planned. Uh, the best schedule, it's always good to have a schedule, but then at the end of the day, understand that uh, different things come up, emergencies, plans change. Um, and so that did happen from the, from the day that we had uh, scheduled or for the days we had scheduled in Malawi, uh, different ministries, some were not able to uh, do things because they had other things on the schedule. So you, you have to kind of uh, be flexible. And it's also important to understand a lot of times when people go on mission trips, they have meltdowns. Okay. Even sometimes a leader does. And so that's the part where you have to have a lot of grace and understand when you spend that many days in a row with either people you don't know or you know really well and get or get to know them really well, uh, just stuff happens. And so you have to have a lot of grace for what comes up. So first things first, uh, just going to Malawi, uh, trying to get a visa approval was, uh, was not an easy process. Mine never got approved. My son's never got approved. A few other people's didn't. So a few of us just waited to get our visa when we arrived. My uh, friends from Pakistan, unfortunately, were never able to get their visa. And so thankfully, one of our team members who's a board member uh, arrived in Malawi the day before everyone else is supposed to arrive. And so she went to with the pastor uh, to try to, to reconcile this, to try to get them approved, wrote a letter. Uh, and they just said, sorry, there's just not enough time um, to, to do what they need to do. And so unfortunately, they were denied entry. Uh, because of these, uh, you know, these different issues and um, what basically ends, what ended up happening is everyone else was able to get through except my friends from Pakistan. Um, and then 
what ended up happening is, you know, because I'd been ministering in Austria, my son and I, we took a four hour train from a uh, train ride from a town in Innsbruck to Vienna. And what's really funny is in the middle of the train ride, the train stops and uh, you hear some, uh, you know, some other language. It's, it's German. And uh, I'm just kind of like, what's going on? And so I ask a couple that would had been talking, they'd been talking a little bit of English, a little bit of some other language. And I said, what's the announcement? And they said, uh, oh, they said we're going backwards to the past train stop uh, for a fix. Well, the past train stop was like 30 minutes um, back. And so I just kind of was like, oh, great, this could this could make our flight tight. So I prayed, of course, that, you know, we would move forward. And probably five minutes later, we started moving forward and they announced everything's fine. We're going on ahead, which I thought was very, very interesting. So, um, you know, as we're heading for the right direction to go to Vienna to catch our first leg of the flight to Malawi, um, we'd already kind of figured out it was a bit delayed um, and, you know, and that was fine. So we flew from Austria to Paris, France, and um, the flight being delayed, we're like, oh, no, we, my son and I were like, we've got to hurry um, so that we can catch our next flight. And so we really ran for 15 minutes through the airport. Now, he's in fantastic shape because he plays soccer. Um, me, not so much. But, um, you know, for the sake of the team, <laughs> team dad and son, I ran through that airport as fast as I could. Um, and we arrived just in time to, to the counter to, to show them the documents to, to get on the plane. Um, but I, I could sense that they didn't seem in a hurry, uh, even though we had just ran through the whole entire airport. Um, we get on the plane and uh, they announce that uh, the flight will not be taking off right away. You know, as they do many times, they say, oh, it'll be this amount of time. Um, you know, and then it just keeps getting stretched out longer and lo longer. And they they finally announce. Uh, we think we're going to just let everybody get off the plane and go to the lounge and then we'll call you back in a couple hours when it's time to leave because they said there was military operations happening in the flight line and so that we couldn't take off. Now, whether that was true or not, I'll never know. Uh, I have my hunches, but um, there was a strike going on in Paris that uh, day when we uh, when we were trying to fly out. So that definitely added to, uh, you know, to the troubles. Um and so what's funny is even though we ran for 15 minutes, you know, you had to think like the luggage probably isn't going to make it. And so instead of them letting off the plane, which would have been great, so you could stretch your legs and not sit on a plane for three hours going nowhere, they decided, well, we're just going to feed you dinner now um, and then we'll depart when we depart. So probably about three hours later, our, our plane took off. And uh, which was kind of nice, but it's get, it was getting late. We were definitely tired. Um, and what happened is we ended up arriving late to Kenya. And so which met, meant we missed our connecting flight to Malawi. But at least on, upon our arrival to Kenya, there was there's probably four of us. We met two men who also had the same issue. They were flying to Malawi. Um, and so they uh, the Kenyan Airways ended up taking us to a hotel, a decent hotel in Kenya, paying for, you know, everything, the taxi, the hotel and all the food. And so we were in Kenya for two days. Now, this was not an expected thing for my son and I, but I was like, hey, this is fantastic. I get to spend more time with my son. We get to have fun. We get to hang out. And so we just enjoyed this very, very nice, maybe nine story hotel. We walked around the hotel. I had a huge pool. So we went swimming one day. It had a huge gym. And he thought it, my son thought it would be fantastic to go to the gym. And so we we did a little bit of the gym stuff. I showed him how everything works because he's at 10 years old. He's not really been to the gym. There was a huge like uh, metal chain. And so I was putting around my neck, doing some reps and just having fun with him. Um, we played games. We hung out. It was a great time eating great food. Um, and you just got to you just got to kind of roll with it. And the fantastic thing is uh, Team Malawi has already arrived um, as, as we're hanging out in Kenya, they're already doing ministry. They're already having a great time led by Maureen. Who's, who's one of the leaders of engaged the nation. Um, oh, and by the way, did I mention, I didn't get my two bags upon arrival. And so they checked for us. They had not arrived. And of course they said some nice thing. Oh, I'm sure it'll get there. You know, um, 
but the fun thing is by this point, my son and I had gone to five countries, a couple of them that were new to me. Uh, Italy was one of them. We went to Italy during the first part of the trip, had some pizza. Uh, but this is the first time I'd actually like been in Kenya other than just being in the airport. And it was his first African country, which I think is significant. Um, but of course, we had two more countries to go. We had to go to Malawi and then on the way home, Amsterdam. So I was able to message the team. They're doing well. Uh, everything was going smooth. They were in great hands. The, t the trip was put together spectacularly. Gideon was doing a great job. Um, and so finally, we found out we would arrive at about 3 a.m. on the 3rd when we were supposed to arrive on the 1st, um, but that's okay. Uh, the great thing of traveling with uh, someone like my son, he uh, he's just a great traveler. I remember the first time when he was like, I don't know, he might have been five, and he, and he flew to Belize. And as the plane took off, he screamed out, yeah, he was so excited. So he's a great traveler. Um, but we got to Malawi at about 3 a.m., you know, took, took about 30 minutes to get to the hotel. We slept for maybe an hour, two hours, uh, got up with everybody, said hello, gave the hugs, ate breakfast, and then we were off to minister. Now that that first day for my son and I was, you know, not the first for everyone else, but uh, one of the members, uh, Robbie, who took all the uh, spectacular photographs and videos, he um, he went to a village by himself where him and I had went in November, a Presby Presbyterian church. So he went and ministered there while the rest of us went to a Presbyterian church in one of the villages. And uh, in that ministry time, we went through a lot of liturgy, had a couple nice services where two of the team members spoke. And then I finished uh, at the end of the service. We prayed for all the people that wanted prayer, uh, pray, played with the kids afterwards, which we, by the way, we had a team of kids with us, uh, ate lunch that was prepared for us in the village, which is usually Sema, some rice, if you'd rather have rice, uh, cabbage, and some kind of meat, whether it's chicken or pork or beef. Um, and so that was kind of that first part of the day. Well, the second part of the day, we were doing going to do a small crusade. So they had rented a truck with a huge TV screen to kind of get people's attentions, put out the chairs, um, kind of did the announcements before we showed up. Uh, and originally, uh, our ministry partner was, he's an evangelist. He was actually supposed to speak at this crusade. Uh, but since he couldn't make it, it's next man up, which means that's that's on me to be the, the main speaker. So uh, I don't think people realize I didn't have my Bible with me. Uh, so I joked, I'm sorry, I don't have my Bible. I can't preach today. And, you know, we just kind of chuckled about it because my Bible was still it was in my luggage. Oh, by the way, that never arrived yet. Um, and so I just prayed, asked the Holy Spirit, what should I teach on? Got a verse. So I just used my phone, got one verse, and then we went for it. Now, Here's the thing, you know, I prayed, ask God what verse to begin with, and then I just, the rest is history. I put my phone away, um, and before I went up there, we had two team members who did a fantastic job of kind of creating a good atmosphere, um, maybe 15, 20 minutes of talks that they gave. Uh, Holy Spirit was moving, uh, and and they had started during the day, and now it's turning to night. Uh, what was great is our cameraman who had been ministering at this other village, he just started to show up right at the end of the last speaker. And so um, it was just, it was just really, really good timing. So um, what what's also fun for me is a lot of the people who have taken classes from me or uh, been involved with Engage the Nations, they've never seen me preach. They've just heard me talk like this, or they've heard me teach. Um, you know, even in my home meetings and those kind of things, I just I just don't have the opportunity to preach a lot, except for uh, when I do certain mission trips or or preach in certain churches. Uh, but it's usually just me doing ministry by myself. So what was really fun is it's always the fun thing for people when they when they experience that for the first time. And so here I am, no Bible, uh, just the Holy Spirit, just going for it. And so as I started preaching, felt the power of God flowing. And I, I need to point out, it is absolutely essential that you have a good interpreter, uh, especially someone who knows you, knows the words you use, understands the inflections you do, the way you move around, everything um, like that really, really helps. And um, it's really important that the translator doesn't just go freestyle on you and start to try to say things that you didn't say. 
Um, Cause I've experienced those funny interpreters that uh, maybe they don't understand what you're saying, or maybe they try to fill in the blanks um, or they tell a funny story when it's not, has nothing to do with what you said. Um, but the great thing about Gideon is um, we've known each other for many years. Uh, we've worked together for many years and we've seen God move powerfully through the ministry that we've done. And it's important to understand that if you don't have a good interpreter, you can be the best minister in the world, but they're the one who's really truly ministering in the local language. And so it's the power of God flowing through both of you as you minister, forming an ark in the spirit so that God can really, really move. Um, otherwise, sometimes one's a weaker vessel and it, and it just doesn't work. Um, and I've, I've been a part of those. And maybe if there's enough time at the end of this broadcast, I'll share a couple of those funny interpreter stories of what people have done. Um, but to continue on with this crusade, um, we're just going. And the great thing is when you have a good interpreter, speak, speak. And it's like almost overlap. It was so good because Gideon's so good. And at the end of the night, after the, at the end of the preaching, we invited people to come forward to, to, uh, to, to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the fun thing is when you do this kind of work, evangelists know, and I would say I'm not really an evangelist, but I do do crusades sometimes and, and God will use whoever's standing there, right? And you know, you invite people to come forward to know Jesus and there's no one standing there. And if you are at all have any kind of insecurities, any kind of like doubts about God, like those things can come up. But I've done this enough times that um, that as I was doing this, I just waited and then called again and called again. And soon you start seeing people coming forward and coming forward. And I don't know, maybe there was 50 people uh, who gave their life to Jesus, uh, 30, 50, 100, I don't know. Um, but either way, it was just fantastic to see people come forward. Then we invited people to come forward for prayer. If they needed prayer, there was deliverance that was happening, manifestation, healing, um, all that kind of stuff. And it was just a great, great night that was really uh, a team effort. Um, and and that was the thing. Is that's what you know. That's what you can expect. The the correct speaker wasn't there. He wasn't able to make it. Someone else has to step in. So you always have to be ready when you go on a mission trip because you might be the next one called up. So. The next day we, uh, you know, we went to bed. The next day we headed out on a two-hour journey to the next village. And here again, these are the kind of things that happened. Unfortunately, the people driving the sound system in another car that we were not in, uh, they didn't put oil in the car. And guess what happens? The engine seized, so the car broke down. And so they were trying to figure out how can we get the PA system to the church grounds before we actually arrive because they're supposed to set it all up. Because as they set it up and the music's playing, uh, it starts to attract people to come because they know there's going to be ministry there. And um, unfortunately, you know, so we had to just wait and wait and wait, which was fine. We we're just hanging out. But eventually they were able to get the PA system. We were probably an hour away. They got it there, got it set up. So we left. Um, and by the time we got there, it was starting to get late. So originally, most of us were scheduled to speak that day. And instead, they said, hey, let's just have three speakers because we were running out of time. And so I just felt led by the Holy Spirit to have three women teach. Uh, they did a fantastic job. They knocked it out of the park. Uh, Phoebe, who was one of the teenagers who came on the trip, I should say the only teenager, she knocked it out of the park like a pro. Uh, the pastor's wife just had this huge smile on her face, not only seeing three women preaching, but a teenager preaching and doing such a fantastic job using scripture, using stories, delivering it really well. Um, and it was really an example to the children in the village of like, God can use anyone and especially a child. And, you know, here's a teenager preaching to a large crowd of people. And then, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the service, we prayed for everybody, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and while we were waiting, you know, we got served some food, the kids were playing soccer and games. Um, and then even after the service, it was pretty cool. Or maybe it was before, I can't remember the timeline. Uh, Sarah, one of the members on the trip, she was actually helping make SEMA, which is like maize that's ground up and then made into this kind of almost like a mashed potato, but a little bit thicker. Uh, so she was learning how they do it, putting it on her head all, and, the, and they were just having a good old time. So it's a great experience to kind of see how these things, uh, you know, ended up. So at the end of that ministry time, we journeyed home in the dark. 
Uh, we arrived safely just to do it again. However, that night I did notice my son was starting to not feel good, uh, which that kid never gets sick. Um, but it, lo and behold, uh, wake up the next day, he doesn't feel good. He, you can just feel he's hot over his whole body. And so I said, hey, go on without me. You guys will be great. Uh, you don't need us. So I just stayed back with my son um, because he just wasn't feeling good. We hung out in the hotel, you know, just uh, he slept almost the whole time. And um, ministry went really well. And, um, and basically, you know, I missed most of the ministry on this trip, which was really, really fascinating. And I had a great team. They didn't need me. But that's the great thing is when one person isn't able to minister, then it gives other people the chance to pray, to prophesy, to pray for healing, uh, to teach. And so everyone got an opportunity, probably much more than they expected. I think some of them expected maybe they'd get to teach once or twice, but many of them got to teach a lot more because of that, which was uh, fantastic. So um, by the end of ministry time, let's see, it was like time to go to safari, time to go to Lake Malawi. And uh, my son was starting to feel better. And so we headed on like a four or five hour journey in the car. Um, and then so, you know, enjoyed the safari, enjoyed time together, uh, enjoyed just ministering to each other, getting to know each other, having long conversations. That's the fun part about some of those long drives. And by the by the end of that drive, my son was starting to feel like 100 percent better. Um and what was what was fun too is in Lake Malawi we did a prophetic night where like I I had like blindfolded some of the kids had them prophesy over people they didn't know who was standing in front of them and then I was blindfolded and prophesied over everybody in the room and our cameraman recorded it all um, and then another night we had everybody kind of prophesy over each other minister to each other uh, which was really good um, what was interesting on this trip is. Everyone went to the school site School site on the July 1st. However, I didn't because my son and I weren't there yet. And so one of the main things was to come to the school to see the school progress. Uh, and so we were trying to figure out, like, can we do this on the last day right before dusk? Uh, because, you know, we were coming from a long ways away. And so we decided, hey, we'll do that. And then I got word one of my uh, of two luggage came in. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, let's let's stop by the airport, get my luggage. So at least I'll have something clean before, you know, before I head home, grab the luggage. Robbie had some problems with his ticket. So he was trying to make arrangements with that. Um, but anyway, when we got to the school and you can see the school videos on the YouTube page of, of the progress, I was really impressed with what Gideon's been doing and the team there. Uh, and I would, at this point, I would encourage you go watch that video and I would encourage you to give towards Engage the Nation to support the work that we're doing in Malawi, that we're doing in Pakistan or the ministry I'm doing around the world, or the classes I'm teaching. Um, we really do need about five to 10 more people, even if you only gave $5 a month, $10 a month, um, 50 any amount would make a significant uh, impact because money does go a long way. Um, and I would mention in Malawi, their, the value of their dollar it keeps going down while the American dollar and the euro are about the same. Uh, so your money does go a long way in these countries. But that's kind of my thing to tell you like, hey, we could definitely use more support for the, the mission at hand. There's other things I want to do like a, uh, like a crusade in Madagascar. God put it on my heart a couple of years ago to do it. And it just, the timing has not worked out. The finances have not worked out yet, but usually a big crusade like that, it's like 20 grand. So, you know, that's where you're getting, you know, thousands upon thousands of people because there's a lot of work that goes into those things. So there are a lot of things that I'd like to do through Engage the Nations, but it's just a matter of uh, finding the right people to partner. So, um, School is going really, really well. Uh, and I would also say if you are considering or have considered going on a mission trip, I would say pray and obey um, because the trip will literally change your life. Uh, you can send an email to pnwseerschool at gmail.com or uh, you, know, you can send me a message on Facebook, Instagram, whatever's the best for you. Uh, we would love to have you go on the next mission trip if you're interested. Um, and then kind of in conclusion, what did God teach me on this trip? I could go through probably 15 minutes of things, but kind of the fun things is I don't need luggage. Okay. Uh, I was at peace the whole time. 
I was able to buy a couple uh, shirts in one of the stores that cost me about $4 a piece uh, in, a, in a US dollars. And then just kind of had the same pants and you just kind of figure it out. Like I couldn't shave. I didn't have a razor, so I didn't shave. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff was just, just fun. That's what you do. And so, uh, and like I said before, my Bible wasn't there. Um, and you just kind of preach and go with the Holy Spirit. And that was the fun thing about the first time I preached is you really have to depend on what have you memorized from the Bible? What, you know, and so things from 10 years ago were coming up as I preached. And once you get in that flow of the Holy Spirit, and like I said, having a good interpreter, um, it was just a great flow. Um, no Bible needed. <laughs> so uh, it was just really good. And I realized not everybody can do that, but it was a good reminder to me to just depend on God. So overall, the trip was excellent. I can't wait to go back. One, um, you know, one prophetic moment that was fascinating on the trip. I, you know, I mentioned I want to go to Madagascar to do uh, to do a crusade. Well, there's a guy I contacted before this trip who, you know, I found from a friend of a friend or whatever, and I talked to him, and because he's also in Malawi, and I just picked his brain and said, "Hey, uh, I would love for you to host me for a crusade in 2023 in Madagascar." And he just said, hey, man, I, I'm way too busy. I'm already booked out because he's doing crusades all over Africa. And I just said, well, if you end up with an opening and God speaks to you to host me, you know, I'd love to do it. And the guy's like, yeah, I, I can't remember what he quoted me, twenty or $40,000 to do the crusade, but it's a lot of money. And I said, well, if God speaks to you and, and God provides the money for me, you know, it'll all work out. And so I'm Facebook friends with him. But it's funny when we're in Kenya coming home, guess who's in the airport? This guy and his wife. So um, I just happened to see him get on the plane. And so when I got on the plane, I saw him and I said, hey, you know, how are you? And it was so funny. Like he just gets this. You can tell he's tired because he's been working his butt off. He just did a crusade and um, I can't remember what country, but um, he was just like, huge smile on his face. And I could actually, as I was talking to him, I could feel the presence of God. This is really funny, stronger than I'd felt on the entire trip because of who he and his wife are and, and, and the presence of God that they carry. But it's just good to say hi. Um, you know, we had talked before over Facebook, it sent some, some message to each other, but I thought, how funny is it? The guy that I actually talked to about, um, hosting a, a you know, a crusade here he is on the plane. And so, you know, we take the flight, get off the plane. We're in Amsterdam. By the way, this is on the way home. And um, we end up kind of uh, close enough in line to where we keep passing each other. The line, no joke, took like two hours in Amsterdam um, because they didn't have enough people working. And so we got to kind of talk through the two hours of security. And I just thought how much of a prophetic moment is it to meet him and his wife while we're going through the line? I just thought like, how funny is that? So um, who knows? Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it'll host a crusade in 2023 or 2024. Um, but it takes the partnership of people really believing in what you're doing and how God's working in your life um, and just how God's working through Engage the Nation. So that's why I share uh, the kind of the the what happens on these trips and kind of give you some e insight into how God moves and what he does. Hope this uh, video has blessed you. And as I said before, if, you, if you're even a little bit curious about joining a trip or hey, maybe you just, you just don't have the time to go on a trip, but you'd love to pay for someone else to go on a trip. I've had people do that before. Um, you know, let me know. I'd love to talk and um, love to have you go on one of the trips with us. So Thank you so much for watching today's broadcast about these uh, the seven seven countries in about three weeks, uh, specifically talking about Malawi. Uh, and we'll see you guys on the next broadcast. That does it for this episode of Everyday Supernatural. Thanks for tuning in. To hear more episodes of Everyday Supernatural, head over to everydaysupernatural.org.